most of you know, he's been in the back, really working hard on this presentation, so I'm very, very excited. Um, his, his resume is, is amazing. <laughs> But I think the presentation shall stay for itself. The old red wall and the wide and wide. All right, good afternoon, evening, everybody. I know I've been told there's a lot of new people here who have no idea who I am and what I'm supposed to do. I usually I work for General Marion. He likes us to come here from time to time to tell you good people what is happening, so you get the truth and not what the British tell you. So a little bit of my background. I have been in military service since 1755. I served with Rogers Rangers in upstate New York. Fought there for five years. Got to enjoy that scenic location of Quebec. Once I came back to New York, well, we're done here. I need you to go to South Carolina. I came down here with a company of Stockbridge Indians to advise Colonel Grant and the governor with their problems against the Cherokee. So I was tasked to advise Middleton's regiment, and at Middleton's regiment, I got to know and got real good friends with a Captain William Moultrie and a Lieutenant Francis Marion. I served with them, I fought with them through the valley of Forlone Hope, I liked what I saw here, so I decided to put down roots of Goose Creek, went into the hide business, found out being a long hunter has a lot of nice money involved with it. Well then this thing with Britain happened once again. And they called the arms, and a lot of my old comrades in arms were joining up, so I decided to go back in. Though I did ask my wife first. And she said, this is what you do best, and if our young lads are going back out there, they need one of the veterans. So I joined the 2nd Regiment, South Carolina Continental Line. I was elected captain. However, I was not given my own command of a line company. Instead, I was given an independent command called the Colonel's Company, which means if there is some problem in the, in the colony, I get to go and face it. I served with the Continentals all the way up through the fall of Charleston. Luckily, I was not in the city when it happened, but when I heard Marion was reforming, I joined him and once more I served alongside him as a member of his brigade. My element is called the band. I, I know, it's not really you know, thunderous, but we call ourselves the band. Mostly it's composed of my sons, my nephews, a couple of the long hunters and veterans I know from the French and Indian War, and three free black men. Our job is we serve with Marion. We're here to support them in our cooperation and provide our expertise. Now, the winter of 1780 was kind of cold, and we're going to 1781. Now, we all know European-based armies, Love to go into winter quarters. It's the same thing. Most of the British forces in down here was in Georgetown, was in Charleston. So Marion sent most of his men home. There was only a small band of us out on Snow Island. Simple logistics. You can't feed that many people. And we don't have a lot of buildings on Snow Island. We don't have barracks on Snow Island. So to take care of the men, we kept a very, very small force. Not to mention, it's a low signature. We don't want to draw attention to ourselves on Snow Island. Well, come around January, we started to get a little bored. And we wanted to remind the Loyalists that we're still here. So we decided to send out Peter Ory, and I went along with him, and basically we're told to go south of Kingston and just let our presence be known. So we headed down to Whackamaw Creek, hooting and hollering, and we did. We did everything our power to scare the Loyalists and let them know that we are still here. We're not done yet, we're still here. So as we're moving through, we did capture a slave mission on the word gets out. Now, within Ori's command is a Captain John Clark. No relation. Because in Captain uh, Colonel Ori's own words, the man is a simpleton. He used other words too, but we're not gonna use that in mixed company. So, these will say he's not the most brilliant tactical officer. He releases the slave. Y'all can imagine what happens in a couple hours. We could hear the bugles coming. So once again, he gets out there. He goes, lads, look, a hunt. Yeah, they're coming for us. 
So as we stand to, we go into the fight, and we do. We have a pretty good fight with the Queens Rangers. We're going back and forth. I mean, it gets to the point that uh, Colonel Ori gets his horse shot out from underneath him. Sergeant McDonald gives him his horse so he can get out of there. So as we're falling back, luckily, we do run into Marion, and we can clear back out. So we push the Rangers away. And then we occupy an old redoubt that the King's Rangers used to occupy. Now, for me, this is a little hard. Because you all know who created the King and the Queen's Rangers. My old mentor, Robert Rogers. Now, I heard rumors that he had come back from Ohio the war had started, he had offered his services to our Congress. They promptly arrested him. <laughs> Needless to say, he lost all favor supporting the colonies and then threw in his services and helped create the Kings and Queens Rangers, which will come back. Luckily, I can say I never had to deal with my mentor from the opposite side, but I had to deal with his tactics. So, as we're occupying, we decided to, you know, Mary said this is enough, we need to go back to the island. And as we're riding back, lo and behold, poor Colonel Ori gets knocked off his horse. Now, I've heard some discussion today, some of the uniqueness about our Colonel Ori. First of all, I said, I've known him since as a captain. I found him to be a very excellent officer, especially when it comes to infantry, because the man cannot ride a horse. <laughs> That's honest, folks. He cannot stay on a horse, and his man knows it. So he gets knocked off his horse, he falls into the water. Oh, yeah, he can't swim. <laughs> so now we got to save our commander. We pull him out, we put him on the horse, we get back to Snow Island. Well, while we're on the island, we hear eventually uh, the victory up at Cowpens that Dan Morgan had uh, beat Carlton good and proper. So we're feeling rather motivated. Now, to Marion, he wanted Georgetown. Bam. Because he knew that if we could take Georgetown, there would be a big thump in the British eye, we would hold a strategic advantage. So we're feeling froggy. We're going to try for Georgetown because Lee was coming. Lee and his legion was coming down. So we came up with a plan. This is what we're going to do. We are going to take Georgetown. We have a lot of horses. We have infantry. So all of us infantry guys, and this is it, again, I need to clarify, I am not a cavalry. Yes, I ride a horse. I am called a mounted infantryman. Notice, I have a rifle, I do have a sword. I am not a cavalryman. I am not like Ori, I'm not like man. Uh -uh. So technically, I'm infantry, I'm a very big brown thing. So his infantry and us decide to take boats. We are gonna come around the backside of, John, of uh, Georgetown because they have a real good defense network out front. The cavalry is going to wait for us. And in the darkness, we're going to come ashore and try to surprise the British, fire off a shot, in comes the cavalry, split in between us, victory! Well, at least that was the plan. So we got on our boats, we go down the river, we go through the rice fields, we get in positions and we wait till the sun goes down. It got good and dark. All you can hear is the waves. We come up on shore, we all get off the boats. Don't hear nothing. So we're moving through the village real fast. We get to the headquarters. We're taking the door. Hey, we caught Colonel Campbell. Yes, we got him. And then we hear a pistol shot from outside. So we held in. We all run out. Across the street was a tavern laying on the ground. Uh, as you imagine, dead British officer, pistol in his hand. And I'm watching another man of Lee's Legion bayoneting this guy on the ground. What are you doing? Man looked at me, he's like, that man gave me 500 lashes. Okay, I, I, I can see where you might be a little angry. It was Major Irvine. But we found where the British infantry were, they're all holed up in this great big brick house. We didn't have a battering ram, we didn't have a cannon. There is no way we can take the city. So we load up on our boats, Headed back to our camp, and we continue to wait it out. We'll try it again another time. Now, during this early season, of course, we need supplies. I don't know if you ever heard of the Postel brothers. James and John. Wow! They went out and they captured four different supply posts. While one was in another one, draw the British away, the other one come around and captured the other one. They went in that a couple times back and forth, 
captured all these supplies, did not lose a single man. We get all the supplies, we put on snows on it. Then they told uh, James, go do a scout around Georgetown. Well, what I heard is the British decided to occupy his father's house. He got a little upset about that. So he paid the house a visit. He came up with his men, he surrounded the house, demanded the surrender. The British, in good tactical sense, told him to bugger off. So it is his father's house, he lit on fire. Uh, he smoked them out. And eventually they did surrender, but the unfortunate thing is the British didn't realize that they had more men than uh, James did. The fact that they just surrendered to an inferior force really drove them nuts, but it doesn't matter if you're prisoners and you took them all in. Now, we were not the only ones out doing raids. As I said, a lot of time our men would go home, spend some time in the winter. Well, old Captain John Clark himself decided to go home on leave. Someone must have found out. The Queen's Rangers actually did a mission and captured him. So this is where, is that a good news story or a bad news story? Yeah, we lost the captain, but it is Clark. We'll take it as a victory and move on. Well, now spring is coming. We all know that's campaign season. So we received our orders. We are to meet with Sumter's Brigade up at Farr's Plantation. So we all go, we call in the militia, we call in everyone from Williamsburg, we all get on our horses, we all start heading up north. We get a message, again, we, you guys heard about our Eyes and Ears Network. Boy, did we have a real good Eyes and Ears Network. They had found out that Colonel Watson was on the move. They had gone after Sumter. Sumter promptly grabbed his family and ran to North Carolina. So now Watson is turning and heading for us. So Mary made the decision that we are going to lay an ambush for Watson at Waibu Swamp. So he deploys Colonel Ory's cavalry in the front. The infantry is in an ambush line behind him. The flanks are covered. We are all set. Here they come. Now, for some reason, they didn't walk right into it. He must have felt a tremor. I think you all in this age call it the force or something. He halted and sent a reinforced reconnaissance element came in to our area. So as they came in, Ori is ready to lead the charge. Now, I already told you, he's not a great horseman. He cannot swim. He also has another minor technical problem when he gets excited. He stutters. Badly. So he's on his horse, here they come, he pulls back his head, it took him 60 yards. He's already 60 yards in front of the man. He goes, you boys know what I mean. And finally they get the hit, and they go. We engage, and we open up, we fire on him. Of course, at that point, you know, wasn't a great ambush, but it was enough to let Watson know that, yes, we are here. So he pulls back. Marin says, we need to keep pressure on him. We need to keep him off balance. So he asked Major James, take 70 men, my band was included, and 30 riflemen from McCaudry's Rifles to go down to the lower bridge in the Black River. Tear it down. We don't want to make sure to, that Watson can get away. So we get down there, there's the bridge. Now on the west side is a taller hill, east side looks smaller, so we basically tear up all the planks on the west side, start burning the bridge, which must have got Watson's attention, because here he comes. So he deploy all the riflemen in the center behind reverberants. The musketeers are on the side. We sit there, and all we're doing is waiting. Watson comes up, rifleman takes out his first lead elements, he goes, all right, he has done this in the past. He will bring up his cannons to clear the area. So he's starting to push his cannons up to the top, those little hills, well, every time they crest the hill, the riflemen shot down all his gunners. And then the gunners would roll down the hill. <clears throat> and then the next group would try to push those guns up, and the riflemen would shoot all the gunners, and the guns would roll down the hill. So now he's got no choice. He comes out, he's forming an attack column. McCaudry has all his men ready. They bring their rifles up. Here comes the column. Bayonets, Lord! They're charging through the water. Water is flying! And all he says is, fire. 
The Black River turned red. We shot a good chunk of those men. They all fell into the water. Now, we're still firing up. My cartridge brings up and down. My cartridge is a really good rifle shot. He comes up, you see him do this. And then he kind of drops his rifle. And he brings it up again. And <clears throat> you okay? He goes, I can't shoot that man. Well, why not? That's my neighbor. That's Captain Brockington. I can't shoot him. Okay. But Watson's got no choice now. He has to push off. So he goes back to the Plakely Plantation. We're chasing him. We want to make sure he doesn't go anywhere. Now, as we're going around, now you've already heard about McDonald. I, I know it was already talked about. McDonald, yes, very impressive fighter. Well, in the middle of all this chaos, he loses his extra set of clothes. Now, folks, let me tell you. Extra clothes is like gold. And he lost his clothes, and the British took it. Oh, the man was upset. So we get in our position around Blakely at the bottom of the plantation. They're all holed up. We're keeping them pinned in. He properly wrote a note to Colonel Watson. Dear sir, please give me back my clothes, or I'm going to kill eight of your men. Sends it. Now, he didn't believe him. His junior officer was like, oh, boss, we, we heard this guy. But, so because he didn't take him seriously, he climbs up in a tree, he takes his rifle with him, gets a good position, fires and hits a British lieutenant at 300 yards. Needless to say, guess what showed up in about an hour? His clothes. So being a proper gentleman, he wrote a thank you note. Dear sir, thank you for my clothes. I only want to kill four of you guys. So now we're holding it. We held him for two weeks. Watson is getting desperate. <clears throat> He's got to get out. So he decides to go down to Sam. He basically gets rid of all. He leaves his wounded behind. He probably think he may have sunk all his dead, so we didn't know. He went down to Sam Pant Bridge. He's making a run for it. He's going fast. Well, just one of those bad days. The, the militia guys we had covering the one side <laughs> got real scared when he came charging across with all those bayonets, glistening, and everything else. Mary's hit him in the rear. We're just punishing him and pounding, 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 pounding. I got one good lucky shot off and I shot the horse out from underneath Watson, but that was better than nothing. Well, see, we also just got a message. Snow Island's in danger. We had him on the run. We could have beat him, but Marion had to make the choice. We're going to about, there's someone a threat to Snow Island, so we got to go. So we all mounted our horses. We rode back. And you could smell it before we got there. That wet smoke. Our island had been destroyed. Every building burnt. All our supplies burnt. Wounded. Dead. What had happened was, I think we became a victim of our own success. We had stayed in place too long. We had a jail full of British prisoners. From what we found out from the survivors is one of those prisoners was able to get out a window, was able to release the rest of the prisoners. They intimidated what little guards were left on the island and did the 25 mile trek to Georgetown. And Colonel Doyle and his Irish volunteers came up and laid waste to Snow Island. Needless to say, Marion was a little upset. So we got on our horses now we're in pursuit. We're chasing after Doyle Wolf. He kind of went through Williamsburg district. And by the time we got to Indian Town, we noticed a lot of our guys decided to go on to leave. They just didn't tell us. So all of the entire brigade, we're down to 70 men. Not a whole lot you can do with 70 men. So we go over to Witherspoon's Ferry. We're engaging uh, the supply. We're shooting at them with rifles. I would have to say at this time, the morale of the brigade was at the lowest I've ever seen. Even from the days of Savannah and the fall of Charleston, everyone was ready to give up. They've lost too many friends. We have no supplies. We've lost Snow Island. It just, we're always on the run. The morale was just so, so bad that Marion finally came up and he gave such an inspiring 
preach, I have to say, the gospel. Without us, who can win? Without our sacrifice, how can liberty flourish? We are the ones who are keeping the British at bay. We must continue to fight. And the men started to go, you're right. Sure, so the motivation was coming back. All right, so let's, what are we gonna do? Do we keep fighting or do we retreat? What do you think they did? Retreat. That was the plan. Even after all that great speech, they still said, no, we need to retreat. We need to go in the swamp, we need to rebuild. But then we found out Lee's on his way back, and he's bringing supplies. So now they all said, all right, we'll stay in this fight. The weather's now getting warmer. Things are getting back and active. So Lee brings us a message. We have a new mission. General Green wants us to get rid of all the British outposts, and we are going to begin with Fort Watson. So we gather our column. We get to Fort Watson, and it's exactly what you saw in that picture earlier. On this Indian mound is this fort, palisade wall, three rows of abatis. They've cleared out all the trees within musket range, so it's a nice killing field, but it's still within rifle range. And that's all we had. No cannons, nothing else. We didn't even do this thing called siege lines. I will pray you on that little thing later. So we're trying to hold them off with our rifles. We're trying to starve them out. And we're waiting. And they're still not giving up. And then smallpox broke out. So we're trying to isolate them. Then the men who were healthy saw the men with smallpox, and they deserted. Now we're running out of time. We had to come up with something. And that's what Colonel Mame says, I got an idea. He goes off to the side, he builds himself a tower. So Mokotri's rifle, they get up there and they have now realized those in Fort Watson are not as safe anymore. We all took turns, day and night. Oh, I mean, I hate to admit, yes, it was fun when you're sitting there and the poor guy's trying to hide. And, you're shooting at the bucket that's next to him as he's trying to get water. And then, or they get water, you shoot the bucket again, the water runs out. They get the hint, and eventually they surrender. So Marion orders the fort burnt to the ground. We head up to the high hand hills, uh, high, hand, high hills of the Santee to rest and recuperate. While up there, we heard of what Green was up to, a little place called Hopkirk's Hill. All right. Things are still a little busy. We get our supplies. Now our next objective is Fort Mott. Now we realize that well, going after a fort with no cannons is rough. So we did ask and we did request for support. And General Green was nice enough to send us a cannon. One six pound cannon from Virginia, Singleton's artillery. So we have Lee's Legion, we have our brigade, we have a little cannon follow us along. We get to Fort Mott. Now, Fort Mott is situated on two fairly large hills. And of course, we're Buck and Mott's house, top of the hill, a Buck, a Buckhead Hill, reinforced palisades, abatis, and then on the other, just across from it is another hill with a farmhouse. So we come up to that farmhouse, Lee goes in there, Marion goes in there, we start looking like, so now we start trying to do this, what they call a traditional siege, where we start digging trenches. They actually had a cannon too. They had a little carronade. Thing is, their gun couldn't move. Ours could. So we kept moving the gun around on them. And we took them under fire. We kept shooting at them. We kept them pinned down. We're just, unfortunately, we just learned that they actually got supplies as we got there. So they're actually real restocked. So this we get to a waiting game. Friction was starting to happen. Morale was starting to get a little close. And then in the distance, you could see campfire. We were too sure it was, so we sent a scout. It is Lord Rowley. He had just abandoned Camden, and he is heading south. We better do something, because even though he's withdrawing, if we get pinned between him and a fort, it's going to be disastrous for us. So we had to come up with something very unique. So, General Marion calls in Miss Mott. Ma'am, with respect, we'd like to burn down your house. And she agreed. Okay, that's permission first. 
So we took some sulfur and we took some tar, we made a nice little fire bomb out of it, we got it ready, we lit the fuse. And I guess one advantage of having that kind of a warm spring in the summer, that nice wooden shingle roof was nice and dry. So up goes the sticky bomb, up goes the fire. Every time the British would go up, we blow them off the roof with a cannon. Great shot. Every time we went up, we blow them down again. They got the hint. And eventually that white flag went up, they surrendered, and we all charged in to put out the fire. Now, Miss Ma, very elegant lady, very proper, very nice, invited us all to dinner. All. <laughs> British, us, Lee's Legion. So we're in at this table. I mean, the smell of charcoal because, you know, the roof's still a little, you know, just extinguished. <laughs> in the middle of dinner, a messenger comes in and tells Marion, Lee's men are hanging loyalists. Marion explodes out of his seat. He takes off running. I went with him, like, oh, this is not good. Normally, Marion's a very calm, collective man. When he does something like that, something bad is going to happen. I followed them. Sure enough, there they were. There's two dead loyalists on the ground, and the third one's twitching and swinging in the breeze. Marion demanded that man to be cut down. Then, of course, the crowd, he definitely let his opinion know. Let me make this clear to all of you. I am in command. The next one of you harms any of these prisoners, I will personally kill. And I am quoting him. He was deadly serious. Any more prisoners were harmed, he would kill that man. So we pull off of Fort Mop. Again, we head off to reconstitute. We heard that Green was very successful up at uh, 96. He's on his way down. Well, summer has arrived. And it's one of those unique, hot, South Carolina summers, even when you're marching. We're also low on supplies. We had no bread, so we did rely on rice. Meat, frogs, we got some frogs along the way. Gator, we did shoot a few gators and got gator tail. That's all we could get. We had no supplies. We lost all ours on Snow Island. Anything that was salted, no. So we're living off these little bit, of course, any fish we could get. I mean, we didn't, you know, we were chasing all the game away. So we finally link up with Green, and the army comes together. It's us, we have Sumter there, Lee is there. Washington's cavalry has joined us. Now we have a good sized force. But Marion wasn't happy. And I was very concerned. Who do you think? We're doing so well. We have all our forces. We're, we're doing great. So I want to go talk to Oscar. If you guys don't know who Oscar was. I think mean, you've heard about Mary, his personal servant. I said, Oscar, what's going on with Mary? And he was very honest. He sees the Continentals. I think he misses the regular army. I think he misses the order, the discipline, the uniforms. He's like, well, we kind of got the we can, but he's a regular soldier. He's always been a regular soldier. And I think he missed it. But he finally got his nerve up. He says, all right, we're doing pretty good. We've got the army together. Let's try Georgetown again. I've got the siege stuff down pretty good. So off we go. We go to Georgetown. We start digging our trenches. We're slowly making approaches up. We're, we're watching each other. We noticed something that was very, very unique about siege warfare. No one's shooting at us. At all. And we're still digging, though. So I'm kind of looking over, and I, I finally asked Mary, and I go, sir, um, you know, no offense. Um, aren't they supposed to shoot at us as part of siege? You know, we dig holes, they shoot back. So be careful what you ask for. Uh, as I said, I'm part of that independent band. He sends my band forward to see what's going on. So we quietly come in through one of the flanking areas. We get into town. Again, we're being very quiet. We're moving through. 
We don't see anybody. We go to one of their large redoubts. There's the cannon. Spiked. Off their trunnions. Not a soul to be seen. We start moving through the town. Nobody. Off on the water are two British sloops. They had just evacuated Georgetown. We signal Marion, we all come in. Marion kind of nods. But he did go through a house and found himself a nice set of clothes. So at least that was a penny. His old clothes were running off. He found himself a new regimental. He felt better. We rejoined the army. Green says, all right, I'm going to go. We all headed to Orangeburg, because there we found where the rest of the British Army organized. But we also found out some great news. Remember Colonel Watson? We broke him. <laughs> We broke him, he sent back to England. He couldn't handle it no more. So they put Colonel Stewart in charge. So we're trying to keep him away from my realm. So there we are, we come up in Orangeburg, and we're challenging him not to fight. Well, hey. So we had a war to win. So Green goes off to do us his thing. We're tasked to go down the river. We're chasing the 19th Regiment. And we come up on Queen Bee Bridge. So the cavalry gets out there, they're fighting around the bridge, they captured most of the baggage train in the 19th. They're trying to destroy the bridge. By the time we get there, the cavalry has chased off uh, the British infantry, we're putting out the fires, we're securing the bridge. We come across the bridge, come up, and as soon as we break out of the woods, this huge open field. And there's Schubert's plantation in the distance. Now I knew Captain Schubert. He's a member, again, who's a captain of one of our companies in the Second South. Unfortunately, he didn't make it when Charleston fell. So we're waiting for Sumter to arrive. He didn't arrive till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And the only reason why I had to say I had to wait for Sumter is they got into a unique, aggressive discussion on data Frank between him and Marion, and who is actually in command. Sumter outranked Marion by his, he was promoted to Breeder General of Militia before Marion. Marion wasn't very happy about that. We're watching the British build their defenses. They are basically using the outhouses, the main building of Schubert's. They're fording up, they're building a square, and they're putting a house right there at the corner facing the road that we're going to have to come up. Sumter finally arrives. Looks at the plan and goes, all right, we're going to have to do actual line of attack. Uh, my men, we're going to come up the left. We'll come through the houses. So, uh, Marion, you take your men through that open field. And uh, Excuse me a second. You want us to cross this open field? Yes, you're going to attack that way, and the cavalry, you're going to go around. We'll, we'll catch them in the pincer. Again, you want us to go across an open field where the only thing that's going to protect us is a fence post. Basically, he told Marion to stop arguing with him and go. And being good soldiers, we did. And we went across that field and got decimated. We did the best we could. Now, Sumter's men, they're coming up through the slave houses and the kitchens, and you know, they have a lot of cover to be behind while we're in this open field. And it's interesting seeing guys trying to lean up against a fence post, you know. So they're not getting hit by the fell state of ball and grape shot coming from that howitzer. We stayed there for three hours. We did the best we could until we ran out of ammunition. And we ran out of light as the sun was going down. We lost 50 men of the brigade. And as we were walking off the field, there's Sumter sitting in the shade. It is the only time, other than when he's threatened to kill the guys who would have uh, hurt a British, Marion went up to Sumter and very quaintly said, I will never serve one more hour under your command, ever again. When we left that night and got to our next camp, most of the brigade deserted. We're down to only 100 men. I can't blame them. We got hung out to dry. That was unfortunate. So we rearmed, we did the best we can, we got our men together, we went down, still a small force, so we engaged at Parker's Ferry, there were some German Hessians coming through, so we were able to ambush them, again, keep them off balance, 
Our focus is again to push on towards Charleston. Well, then we heard that Green has returned and the army is on the move. So Marion, we all pick up our forces, we go to Lawrence Plantation, and we link up with General Green, who had no idea that we're operating in the area. So he pulls Marion in, and our objective is a place called Utah Springs. He highlighted his plan of action that he's going to use his three lines that he used before so well, that the first line will be the militia, and anchoring the right side of that line will be Marion and his South Carolina Brigade. The center is North Carolina militia with two three-pounders. And on the left side is Pickens and his brigade. Behind them will be the Continentals. So as we form and get ready on this wonderfully warm day, we had to take into stock and account the condition of our men. Most of our men had barely, barely any clothing on by this point. Some were naked. Some maybe had a loincloth out of a ratty old shirt they were able to put together. But yet they had their cartridge boxes, their morale was decent, they were ready to go into the fight. So they send us out as the advance guard. We're moving through the woods and we're advancing and we just happen to come across a British foraging out looking for sweet potatoes that morning. We get into a good firefight, and the musketry's going on back and forth. Green hears it, he comes up, he sees the action, and the, the men are falling back. He goes, great, we know where they're at, we got them. He brings out, rum. Yeah. What? Let the men have rum, for it'll bring out the animal spirits in them. I go, well, it's gonna bring out some type of spirits in them. I don't know about hell. <laughs> But okay, so he gives out everyone rum. Everyone's, oh yeah, this is great, let's go. And once more he sends us forward and we're advancing through the woods towards Utah Springs. As we're going through the woods, across from us are British counterparts coming through the woods. And for a moment, we stop and stare at each other. When... <laughs> Luckily we fired first. That's how the battle started. We engaged their skirmish line. We hit them hard. We start to push them through. So as they're falling back, our entire line is just moving forward. And I'll give again, we talk about the artillery. Those guys and that two little three pounders kept up with us. They're pulling that gun around through the woods. We get up there, they blast away. We fire on the British. Eventually we get to their main line. In the woods, stretched out before us. And we went into action, blazing away, shocking all, because yeah, a lot of guys were naked. But yet, as it described, the men marched in such a professional manner that it made Frederick the Great proud. I don't know, but proud to be in his ranks. They acted professionally. Just because they weren't in any clothes, they were just as professional. So we're laying waste in our British counterparts. The artillery is blasting them away. We're going at it as hard as we can until we run out of ammunition. At that point, we have no choice. Green pulls us out and sends in the Continentals, and they slam into them. Well, now the British are starting to fall back. But now we go to the rear, we try to get re-ammunition as much as we could. We come back in, and by then, there before us, stretched in all its glory, the British camp. So as we're marching through, the Continentals are more going to the left. We and the militia are kind of going straight towards the camp. And as we get there, like any good soldier, look, there's food on the fire. <laughs> the momentum stops. Guys are going into the tents. They are finding clothes. They are eating food. There, I mean, it's just complete, utter chaos. Now, on the left, the Continentals are going up. We capture two British six-pounders. We got them on the run. All it would take was one more good charge and we could have took the Battle of Utah Springs, but no! Oh, the militia and some of the Continentals, let me tell you, that's not just the militia, but some of those North Carolinians as well, helped themselves to the entire British camp. There's guys walking down there with six hats on their head and tell me, what are you going to do? You can't eat a hat. 
They were wearing women's clothes. I mean, they were grabbing anything they could. Green knew that we had lost the momentum. The British had all fallen back or inside the large brick building. We even turned around their six-pounder and started to fire away, but now they're picking our men off. We had no choice. We had to fall back. So we regrouped. Guys were starting out looking at new clothes. Fortunes of war, I guess. But now we gotta keep them going. So we leave Utah Springs and we are moving along and we go into camp. It's early November and the temperatures are finally coming down. We get a message. Cornwallis had surrendered in a place called Yorktown. And of all things that Marion decides to do is hold a ball. Of all things I would guess Marion would do, having a ball would not be one of them. But yes, let us have a party. So at the plantation we were camped at, we had a ball, we invited in all the local ladies, they had a great celebration. I go, well, that's good, sir, but we're not done yet. We still got missions to do. So after the party, we start a move, and again, continuing with Green's plan of pushing in all the outposts. Now we are trying to sweep down and head towards Charleston. So we're tasked with this little place called Fort Fairlawn. I don't know if you've ever seen this place. It's a rather impressive redoubt. Colonel Mame is given the command. We owe him and. Some of our men now, because we had been decimated so bad, we did get reinforcements. Green gave us the over the mountain men from Shelby and Spear. So they rode up with us. Now, we passed one British outpost. We challenged them to come out to fight us, and they wouldn't come out. So Maine decided to continue on towards Farallon. I'm like, you shouldn't leave an enemy behind you, so our rear guard, and sure enough, here comes the British dragoons following us. We come up on Fort Farallon. So again, we have horses, we have muskets, we have rifles, no cannon. Nothing we can do about a pretty reinforced, moated redoubt. But they did have a hospital on the outside. So man decides we're going to charge the hospital. He takes them all prisoner. We captured 300 stands of firelocks. That's the muskets, that's the bayonets, that's the cartridge boxes. We captured the surgeons, the orderly, all the sick, all the wounded, except for the smallpox. We're left them alone. <laughs> we paroled anyone who could not move, anyone who could walk. We took prisoners, and we did this all in front of the British commander who was watching us from the fort and never came out. So we return with our prisoners. Now, as we start the end of the year, November is coming on, we're heading towards the end. Our primary job was to screen the army. We established a new base on the Cooper River. We had to screen the army because by now, General Green's mighty Continental Army was down to 800 men with four cartridges each. We couldn't really put in much of a fight. So now we're watching, we're seeing what's going on, making sure that the, all the British are heading towards Charleston. So our next objective is to go into the town of Dorchester and take the fort. Which is unique for us, being old members of the 2nd Regiment, for that is where we used to garrison. So we had a pretty good knowledge of what the fort looked like, where it was in the town. So this was given to Lee and his legion. So we're leading them in. They didn't, you know, we did run into a very small loyalist cavalry force. It wasn't very much of a fight. But once we got into Dorchester, they must have heard we were coming because the fort had been abandoned. All their supplies were on fire. And all the little iron cannons they had were gone. We believe they must have thrown them in the river. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how we ended the year 1781. So, tough year, ups and downs. But we could see that the end was close. 
that we're driving the British in. It just took, it's just going to take a little bit more time, and victory will soon be ours. Like we always say, well, I'll save that story for another time. Any questions? Yes, they were very effective. There was no infighting. There was no whose rank goes bigger than whose rank or date of rank or anything. No. They worked well together as a, as a combined force. Invite them all to Camden. And yes. Yeah, Mayor of Camden in uh, second weekend of November. You can come watch us in action. Other than that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for making the 20th anniversary of our symposium so well. We'll do it again next year. Safe journeys, y'all.